In this segment, we're going to talk about some considerations when training and optimizing neural networks. So these are just going to be a few kind of practical techniques that are uh, going to be useful for the kinds of networks we're going to see in this course, and we're not going to go too, too deep on it. So the first uh, thing that you know, essentially always uh, is something you're going to use is what's called batching. So batching is where you process multiple data points in parallel. And, you know, one of the main reasons to think about doing this is it can speed up your, uh, you know, basically the amount of, it can reduce the amount of time that a single epoch takes pretty substantially because you can do uh, more efficient matrix operations and achieve higher parallelism by operating over uh, a group of points at a time. Uh, and so this does actually require making the computation graph be able to take not just one data point, but actually a whole bunch of them. However, this is not too difficult in PyTorch because of the way that everything is structured in terms of tensors. So instead of thinking about uh, an input, which is just a number of features, and a gold label, which is just like a, a number of classes, and these are both vectors, now we're going to think about these as matrices, where we have an extra dimension which reflects the batch size. And it turns out that the forward implementation for this network does not need to change at all. Everything that uh, exists in the running example we have so far generalizes seamlessly to this case. And what happens now is the probabilities that we get out are now a matrix, where um, each row is a different example in the batch. Uh, the one place that things need to change here is that when we're thinking about the loss, we need to actually accumulate that down into one number. So we do need to sum these negative log probabilities across the batch, um, but that's not too onerous. And again, because the other operations are all kind of naturally defined in terms of tensors, we don't need to do other modification here in order to batch our, uh, in, you know, in order to implement batching in our network. So this is very nice uh, in that you should be able to get code working for a single instance and then generalize it without too much difficulty. In terms of batch sizes, uh, it's hard to give a kind of range uh, that is universal for all problems. Uh, you know, anywhere between one and a hundred, usually. Uh, it, the story changes pretty substantially when you're dealing with pre-trained models. Uh, and a lot of times when you're training more sophisticated networks, batching is very important, not just from a standpoint of speed, but also from a standpoint of uh, kind of optimization and getting to a good uh, optimum. So. Uh, using a batch size, uh, a kind of moderate batch size of like 16 or 24, especially when you have a, uh, a decent sized GPU is often a good idea. Um, but on a lot of simpler cases, like training a very basic seek to seek model, um, batch size one kind of works just fine from the standpoint of uh, you know, what you actually converge to. Okay, so the basic framework is that we have a batch, we compute gradients on it, and then we use one of these uh, first order optimization techniques that just need access to gradients. So the main questions we're going to try to answer here are initialization, regularization, and optimization. And again, there is, there, you know, there is such deep theory behind all of these things that uh, there's no way we can cover it. So uh, there's entire courses you could take to try to understand these things more. But here we're going to talk about this mostly from a practical standpoint of what settings of hyperparameters you'll typically want to use. All right, so here is our basic feedforward network. And so to think about initialization, what we want to start out with is thinking about V and W here. And how we initialize them and what consequences it has. So this is a non-convex problem, so the initialization matters. In particular, if you initialize v here to 0, 
you could think about what might happen. What happens is that with either of the choices for g listed here, you end up with z that is all zero all the time. And what happens then is that the model never gets off the ground with respect to learning, because essentially logistic regression, the last layer, is just seeing a vector of all zeros. It has no idea uh, kind of which of these features might be useful because none of them can convey any information. And so the gradients just end up being zero and nothing gets learned. So we need to initialize to some non-zero value for the early layers of our network in order to be able to break symmetry between uh, different uh, hidden units and, and kind of get learning off the ground. Now, how does the fact that this model is nonlinear affect things? So here we're showing hyperbolic tangent. And when we go out to the edges of uh, the curve here, we start to see that the slope of hyperbolic tangent gets pretty flat. And this corresponds to a phenomenon called saturation of gradients. So imagine that the inputs to this network um, are or the inputs to this layer, let's say, are always going to be very large or very, you know, very large positive or very large negative. So we're always getting five or minus five or something on that order. It turns out that then the model doesn't then try to change those inputs very much because the gradient is so flat here. It looks at this and says, okay, well, even if I were to change the input, it won't actually change the output that much, so like, why bother, right? So you're all the way out at five, kind of saturated over here, and the model doesn't even want to think about bringing it back towards the origin, and so it's very hard for learning to happen because you're going to pass back a very small gradient through this layer. Um, so this is one reason to consider using uh, rectified linear units or ReLUs, these kind of hinge-shaped things in, in green here. Uh, these can produce larger values, um, th but they have a similar sort of problem, which is that if everything ends up being negative somehow, um, you know, you can also get a little bit stuck. Um, so again, you have to think about the right way to initialize uh, in order to avoid these things happening. Uh, and so, you know, we don't want to just initialize to all zeros. We don't want to initialize too large. So there's been a lot of thought put into what the right uh, technique for initializing is, both from a distribution standpoint and also the scale. Uh, so one initializer is due to Xavier Gloreau, and it looks like a uniform distribution between this funky expression here that is based on the so-called fan in and fan out of a layer. That's just a fancy term for uh, the number of inputs to that layer and the number of outputs. And the reason we, we kind of scale things and do this funky thing is that we want the variance of the inputs and then the gradients for each layer to be about the same. So, you know, we might have some layers in our network which are like 100 dimensions in and 50 dimensions out. We might have others which are 1,000 dimensions in and 500 dimensions out. And these are on very different scales, and so we need the right initializer that balances things so a single gradient update with a single step size can, can do something reasonable. Um, there's a more sophisticated take on this sort of idea, not for initialization, but um, during learning, something called batch normalization, where what we do is we take each layer's activations and we shift and rescale them across a batch so that they have mean zero and variance one. Uh, this is not going to show up that much in this course. It's much more of a consideration in computer vision, where uh, if you have very deep networks you need to think about, uh, again, how to kind of balance these, uh, basically how to balance the optimization across these different layers. All right, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to say about initialization. Um, there's various sort of pre-constructed schemes that you can use, but it is important to use something and not just initialize to zero. Uh, 
for dropout, uh, we can zero out parts of the network during training to prevent overfitting. That's the basic idea behind dropout. And then at test time, we're going to use the entire network. So the sort of idea here is that uh, we don't want, like the, one of the ways you can get overfitting in a classification model is if uh, you have two features that are highly correlated but maybe differ on one example. And then, you know, those features in aggregate should give a score of like plus one most of the time. But what you do is you set one feature to plus 10 and another feature to minus nine because now it lets you really fit that one example where they do something different. And then most of the time they just cancel out and give you one. So this is a kind of stochastic way to enforce that something like that is not happening. And the reason is because when you drop out sort of random chunks of your network, you prevent these uh, different neurons or, or activation uh, or you know, cells in the layers from learning to uh, you know, this kind of highly co-evolved behavior. Another way to think about this is it's connected to ensembling. Basically what you're saying is I want any random subnetwork to be able to do well at this problem. And so then at test time when I take the whole network, that's like having an ensemble of a whole bunch of subnetworks. And so, you know, even if some signal is is kind of missing from the input or whatever, um, you know, we've got other parts of the ensemble that can maybe pick up the slack here and uh, you know, this should r roughly still be able to do the right thing. Um, so this is, a, this is a relatively easy thing to add. You can just add a layer that allows you to do it. Um, I will say that uh, setting dropout rates too high like, uh, is, is, is a good way of actually getting bad performance. Um, and uh, usually this doesn't matter as much as you might think it does. So it can be a nice thing to add that can give a little bit of performance in increase, but uh, is generally not too important. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is the choice of optimizer. So one good choice uh, is an optimizer called Atom. This is very widely used, especially in NLP, and the, it combines two ideas. Um, one is the notion of an adaptive step size. So this looks like basically for each coordinate we uh, think about essentially what the size of the gradient updates we've seen for that coordinate is, and we rescale it appropriately. And then momentum is the other uh, trick this, this incorporates, meaning that we ha basically use an exponentially weighted average of uh, the past few gradient updates, and you know when you make an update, that, that update will then inform the next few updates as well. That's kind of why it, it feels like momentum. I mean, these are both these are both effective techniques. There's lots of uh, methods that balance these two things, but uh, Adam is one that's pretty widely used that seems to work well for a lot of NLP problems. There are some results uh, due to Aisha Wilson et al. from NeurIPS 2017 showing that these methods actually might not be the best thing for test time. Um, so on the top, uh, Adam is fitting the data really well, uh, but on the bottom, uh, Adam doesn't actually generalize as well as uh, SGD with like carefully tuned learning rates and, and momentum and things like that. So uh, it's sort of an open question. Um, Adam is going to work well for a lot of what we do in this course, and so that's the that's the kind of recommended one that just kind of works out of the box most of the time. And the final thing uh, that is important from optimi an optimization standpoint, especially with uh, more complex models, is gradient clipping. Uh, basically, you don't let the gradient exceed some max value, and this just uh, kind of ensures that it doesn't go too off the rails during learning. So we've talked now about some different considerations for initialization, regularization, and optimization. And so uh, you can refer back to this or use this as a resource for uh, thinking about what values of hyperparameters to use, et cetera. But uh, you know, we've given you here the basic template, I guess, for most of what we're going to use in this course from a, an implementation standpoint. That's it for this segment.